shouldn't surprise us that one of the most powerful evidences for Christ, Christian community, would also be the thing that comes under the most attack. That must be some kind of a coincidence, huh? This has been true throughout Christian history. We see it in the book of Acts. We saw it in the early church under the Neronian persecution, the Domitianic persecution into the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries. They were collecting Bibles and burning them right before Constantine allegedly came to faith in 325 or 313 or whatever. So too, when we look throughout Christian history, whenever there was an evangelistically oriented missional church, they always came under fire. One example would be the Anabaptists. These were a weird group of Christians that believed that if you were baptized as an infant, you needed to be Anabaptized. You needed to be baptized again. And so both Catholic and Protestants viciously persecuted these people. There are accounts that the Anabaptists, which is called not the Reformation, but the Radical Reformation, the Anabaptists were captured and weren't just burned at the stake, but some of the Reformed churches built instruments where they would lean them over the bonfire in order to make them sizzle. So the Anabaptists were persecuted like crazy, even by their own mentors. There's persecution around the world today. And when you're part of the state church, like in China, they got no problem with that. But again, if you're part of any kind of a house church movement or a missional evangelistic church, those are the ones that they're getting taken away and put in prison. To be honest, here in the West, we live in kind of a historical bubble that is odd, biblically speaking. And we've come to think of it as normal. This isn't normal. When we meet all of the saints in heaven, they're going to say, you guys were the odd ducks. I mean, to live in that time and place and to think that was normal when it wasn't. The norm for any church that is going to be reaching the world for Christ is going to be persecution. Well, in our particular time period and setting, we face a number of different methods in what we could refer to as a post-truth culture. In a post-truth culture, there's many different methods that we really need to come to terms with. The first would be misinformation about Christians. Now, of course, according to Athenagoras in the second century, he was a Christian philosopher. He said the Christians were accused of being cannibals, atheists, and incestuous because they ate the body and blood of Jesus, they married their sister in Christ, and they didn't believe in any of the gods. So, ah, theos, the atheist. Today, since we have the internet, basically anybody can write anything and misinformation spreads faster than truth. Here's Zarush Vizoji. He's a data scientist at MIT. He studied Twitter from its inception in 2006 to 2017. He studied 126,000 news stories, which were retweeted 4.5 million times. And he checked these stories with, quote, six independent fact-checking organizations that exhibited 95 to 98% agreement. So that would be very good peer review, wouldn't you say? Here's what he found. Quote, falsehoods were 70% more likely to be retweeted than truth. Even when controlling for the age of the person who holds the account, the activity level, and the number of followers and followees of the original tweeter. He, on page 1150, marks this up to what is called the, quote, novelty hypothesis. That when you see something new or something that's shocking, this makes you want to retweet it or pass it along via whatever social media venue you use. In fact, he has this chart in the article, and I don't know if you can see that, but I blew it up. The stories that were most likely to be retweeted were those which had three specific characteristics. Surprise, disgust, or fear. The least likely stories to be retweeted were those which pushed joy or trust. Why? Because of human nature. When we see something that surprises us or disgusts us or makes us afraid, we are far more likely to push that forward. Julia Baum from Humboldt University writes this. She says, spontaneous likability 
deliberate person judgments, and emotional person evaluation were strongly influenced by what? Negative information, yet remarkably unaffected by the trustworthiness of the information. Are you reading what I'm reading? That should scare you to death. That someone could read something about you, read something about your church, and it doesn't even matter to them if it's true, they're already making a judgment evaluation regardless of the truth. So she writes, our findings demonstrate a tendency for strong emotional evaluation and person judgments, even when they are knowingly based on unclear evidence. This is in an age when, according to Pew Research, most people get their news from social media. Six out of 10 people. Reddit came in number one on the list. You know, that bastion of truth in our day, Reddit. <laughs> most people get their news from Reddit or Facebook or Twitter. So misinformation, that's gonna be a problem. This leads, and these are all kind of interconnected, into dehumanizing other people. When you're anonymous, when you're not talking face-to-face -face with a person, it becomes very likely to dehumanize that other individual through what we might call caricatures. You know, when you go to Cedar Point and the artist draws you with a big head and, you know, a little Jeep or something, and, you know, they're making a caricature of you, so they exaggerate all those features, you know what I mean? Well, this is what happens with those who are trying to marginalize or persecute or attack people of different races, different political views, different religions. We saw this in Soviet Russia. How was it that Stalin was able to steal and seize the land of the kulaks, the wealthy peasant landowners? He killed millions of them. It's because he had a whole propaganda machine that called them vermin, scum, and rats. Joseph Goebbels, he was the propaganda minister for Hitler's Third Reich. Same thing, referred to the Jews as rats. And when you can dehumanize other people, other faiths, other political parties, other ethnicities, and especially when you don't have to actually see them face to face, this leads to an incredible cruelty. Well, the same is true during World War II. We have our propaganda machines as well. When we were fighting the Japanese, you see this. It's a Japanese man with long nails, almost like an animal, and he's grabbing a white woman. You think that was an accident? And it says, this is the enemy. A caricature, trying to make these people subhuman, animalistic. Same is true for the Jews. They were considered snakes, or they were considered devils, that they owned all the money. Conspiracy theories abounded. Now, don't, don't get me wrong here. What I'm not saying is that Christianity in the West is being met with this level of persecution. I don't believe that. I'm not saying it's, it's reaching the same quantitatively, but it is reaching the same qualitatively. It's the same type of persecution. Do you see my point? Not the degree, but the same kind. Not the same in degree, but the same in kind. Remember when the internet came out and everyone was like, this is going to bring the human family together. Like, we're all just going to share ideas and it's going to be great. No, what it's done is it has revealed what's been in the human heart the entire time. It's become a breeding ground, a swamp of anonymity and de-individuation, depersonalization, taking people's personhood from them. So Aaron Buckles, who is a Canadian psychologist, can write this in her article, Trolls Just Want to Have Fun. <laughs> Internet trolling correlated positively with sadism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism using both enjoyment ratings and identity scores. Let's define. Sadism, that word comes from Marquis de Sade. He was a French beater and torturer of prostitutes. Psychopathy, or psychopathy, however you pronounce it, this is uh, basically a descriptor of people who lack empathy. They're unable to control their impulses. And Machiavellianism, you know, to, to, to win at all costs. So whether or not what I'm saying is true, that doesn't matter. What I'm posting on the internet, what I'm saying on social media, whether it's true, it doesn't matter. From a Machiavellian perspective, you're just trying to win. 
She writes, of all personality measures, sadism showed the most robust associations with trolling. And again, you know what I mean by trolling, right? Trolls are people that just get on there to, to muckrake and to insult and just to stir up controversy. She says, sadism is the most closely associated with trolling. And importantly, the relationship was specific to trolling behavior. Thus, cyber trolling appears to be an internet manifestation of everyday sadism. When you can be anonymous, when you don't have to look the other person in the eye, when you can be cowardly, in other words, and you have a platform to say whatever you want in the meanest and most degrading and depersonalizing of terms, the internet is your wonderland. So too, methods in a post-truth culture are to silence those with whom we disagree. So not to have an active discussion, not to dialogue, not to debate, that has been thrown out the window, but to actually silence people. So under this view, disagreement is considered what's called gaslighting. Gaslighting comes from an old play where the husband was making the wife feel totally crazy because he kept turning down the gaslight little by little. And throughout the play, she kept saying, it's getting dark in here, isn't it? No, you're crazy. You're crazy. And he kept turning it down a little bit more. It's really getting dark in here. No, you're, you're, just, you're just going nuts. You're cracking up. So if I, for example, as one of the, the pastoral leaders here at our church, if I was interacting with a person and I said, okay, let's bring the two parties together. Let's have you and the other person reconcile. Let's have you guys work through the issue. Let's have some peacemaking. Let's if I was to disagree with their account of what happened, that would be considered, according to many people, gaslighting. So I raised a problem with what happened, and now you're telling me I'm nuts, I'm crazy. Or you're manipulating me. If I disagree, that's, that's coined as manipulation. Matthew 7, we got to get the log out of our eye before we can get the speck out of our brothers. To have people there... And to say, you know, I think you contributed something and I think they contributed something too. That's considered shaming the victim. Or it's mind control, it's brainwashing. Basically, according to Robert J. Lifton, who studied this, these are referred to as thought terminating cliches. He doesn't say that with regard to these statements. Because I think that these are true. Is it possible to gaslight people, make them feel crazy when they're in the right? Absolutely. Is it possible to manipulate people? Yes. Where have you been? We live in a fallen world. To shame the victim when they're the ones who are actually hurt. Absolutely, of course. But what these buzzwords are used as, at least in our culture, are used to terminate thought. The discussion can't go any further because if you proceed any further, it's considered an act of violence against the other person. So in a post-truth culture, these are the, the means through which many people operate. This is from the internet I picked up. This cult creeped its way into my high school almost two decades ago. It offers an artificial environment for lonely kids. They manipulate social groups, send very young university students to act as leaders. It was a negative, abusive system, lurking kids, uh, luring kids with fun, organized activities. The religious brainwashing then starts. Keep your kids away from this group. I hope it is banned from all schools like all cults. You see the loaded language here? Cult, it creeped in there. They're manipulating. They, uh, it's an abusive system. It's not an individual person. It's the entire system. This is all the language of postmodern culture today. What about this? It's really sad that the quote-unquote blame has shifted to me, victim blaming. Again, this is typical of those whose faith is so shallow that they could never admit that their pet group could ever be wrong. Tell that to the 900 followers of Jim Jones who also drank the Kool-Aid. You know who Jim Jones was? He led a cult group that resulted in 918 people drinking arsenic-filled Kool-Aid and committing mass suicide, including killing a U.S. senator. Jim Jones, a horrific cult. Boy, is that loaded language. Uh, they're a cult in the sense that it encourages separation from the outside world, implies that all other types of Christians are inferior. There it is. And practice is mind control. So if you come into this church, all of a sudden they're trying to control your mind. 
They achieve their goal through gaslighting, coupled with kindness. So they pretend like they're trying to be kind, but really they're just trying to gaslight you and tell you you're the one in the wrong, you're the sinner, you're screwed up. Very unprofessional, and might I add, brainwashed. You see the language? This is the typical language in a post-truth culture that it isn't, it isn't civil discourse. It isn't disagreeing. It isn't pointing out the errors. It isn't getting concrete. It isn't talking about people or situations or events. It's just using these very nebulous, vague accusations and loaded language that silence those with whom we disagree. This is basically language that is used to silence the other person so that we can't have a dialogue with one another. What church was this written about, by the way? That evil Christian church, Young Life. You know, Young Life, that brainwashing cult. I hope that doesn't get taken out of context online. <laughs> I don't mean that. They can utilize a cynical narrative, so it isn't the data. The data are there for everyone to see. But it's seeing it through a specific narrative. Do you know what I mean by that? A narrative is basically a way to perceive or interpret the data. Here's one example from our church. We got onto uh, Pathios, which is a, uh, basically a religious website, very popular. And I was really excited because you know our church got featured there. And then I read the title, Turned Up for Jesus. And I thought, oh no, this is not going to be good. And that's one of my dear friends up there, Abby Merker. So this is what this young woman had to say about our church. She said, observe this photo, which is taken from the Xenos website. Nothing in this photo landed there by accident. How many hipster Christian points can you detect? A young woman speaks while seated in a place of prominence. Oh yeah, she's on a stool. Show that women are in charge around here. <laughs> the display wine glass on the entertainment center speaks to the group's tolerance of drinking. That was placed there to show that we're cool with drinking, yeah. Z-O-M-G, Pop Culture Ahoy, Spider-Man, Star Wars, I myself own that Darth Vader bobblehead, and probably more. Uh, that map on the wall behind the speaker ain't there by accident. The residents of this home want to show that they look outward to the world. What about this guy? The beardy hipster Christian to the left there, stroking his resplendent beard all contemplative-like. A young person looking for a relaxed vibe in church might well see a picture like this and think that this group will be less intense and more welcoming than the typical fundagelical, fundamentalist evangelical, question mark, church. Unfortunately, it's just marketing hype. Do you know whose house this is? Mine. <laughs> we met in this house for about two years. Guys, I'm just not that good with decorating. I'm just really not. Uh, if it was up to me, my house would be four white walls, no pictures. It would look like a prison. I mean, and, uh, but, 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 you see my point? When you start seeing everything through a cynical lens, the less you can see reality and all you can see is your lens. It's a narrative. Making unfalsifiable claims. How is it in a post-truth culture that this would work? You know, I was really hurt by somebody in your church. Okay, who was it? Well, I don't want to say. Okay, well, what's your name? I don't want to say that either. What did they do? Well, I don't want to say that either. How can we apologize or grow or help others if we can't actually look into the story involved? I can't tell you how many cases I've run into of people where I'm saying, hey, I'm here to help. If something like that happened, I would want to offer a word of correction and actually speak to the person who said or did that to you. Instead, making an unfalsifiable claim, I can't, I can't do anything. And so it lingers as kind of just a vague cloud that we can't, we can't interact on this at all. And dedication to Christ is increasingly being seen as cultic in our culture. Uh, if you can't beat them, insult them. That's the way our culture works. And this is true in the political sphere, in the ethical sphere, in the religious sphere. It's on all sides. It's human nature. If you can marginalize and insult people that disagree with you, basically, if, if you can't beat them, then beat them up. So, for example, we can read this. 
if you leave the ministry, don't count on remaining close friends with the people. Uh, they claim to, quote, always be there for you and support you, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The group shames people who have priorities, for example, their education, and that they encourage people to cut ties with people, even their families, if they're not supportive. Generally, a cult won't immediately drag newbies or potential newbies into the extremes of the group. They'll show them how tight-knit and faithful they are instead. The point is usually to recruit, not scare off. The organization will encourage you to cut ties with those who are skeptical. That's pretty cult-like to me. They are one of the biggest cults on college campus. You see, you see this? I can't, I can't look into any of this. If something happened here, I would want to be the first one to know about it. That's for sure. What church was this? Oh, that evil, wicked campus crusade for Christ. Are you seeing a little repetition here? If you think that there is such a thing as joining a church that is missional and wants to reach people that don't know Christ, and you won't face accusation, that is a myth. That is a fallacy. To a biblically trained mind, that is nothing short of absurd we will face persecution. Absolutely we will. How do we respond? Number one, for the love of God, we need to love these people. We need to respond with good works. We read in Titus 2, in the case of slaves and Greco-Roman slavery, they must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. Why? Slaves? They must not talk back or steal. Why not? They're slaves. But they must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy and good. Why would they do that, Paul? He says, because then they will make the teaching about our God and Savior attractive in every way. Remember we said good works don't replace the gospel, but what do they do? They beautify the gospel. Cosmeo. Cosmetic is the word here. Make it attractive that when they see people that have every right to fight back, a slave in this context, treat them with love and respect and kindness, that makes the message of Jesus all the more attractive. Philippians 2.14, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Yes. Everyone in our culture, what do they do in the working world? They complain, they bicker, they argue. He's saying here, to stand out as people who have hope, people who have love in their heart. It's like looking out at the night sky and seeing stars out there. They sh they, the darker the sky becomes, the more the stars shine. And he's saying, by having this attitude of service and love in our world today, not complaining, not arguing. We stand out, not returning evil for evil, not using the same tactics against other people with whom we disagree. Matthew 5.16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 1 Peter 2.12, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. It is God's will for you that your honor honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. To live such a life of love that when people make an accusation against you, it just flows right off your back. There's no way it's going to stick because people in your life know you. They know... Okay, I'm hearing one thing on the internet, and yet I'm looking face to face with this person here. I don't believe that. I don't believe that that person is like that. When we're being verbally attacked, when we're being caricatured, when all these things are happening, it's very easy to develop a hardened heart. And Jesus implores us to keep a warm heart, to love your enemies, and to pray for those who persecute you to love them. We don't have to agree with them. But we do need to love them. We do need to pray for them. That God would arrest their heart. That He would change their heart. Be gentle with people. But, but meekness is not weakness. 
Jesus describes himself as gentle in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And yet Jesus was not a weak man, that's for sure. Jesus was the paragon of strength and courage and toughness. He was not weak. We read in 1 Peter 3.14, Do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. He's speaking into a situation in these various churches where there was verbal persecution. That's what he was referring to, Peter. Don't, don't fear their intimidation, their slander, or be troubled. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, you got to be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Do you see what I'm seeing in this verse? When people are harassing you, when people are attacking you, when people are caricaturing you, do not sit there and take it. Stand up for yourself and defend your faith. You're a Christian. You don't just sit there and laugh about it. You stand up and you say, that isn't true. How about the one guy in the working world I heard about recently? He was getting picked on for being a Christian. Day after day, week after week, finally he went up to the guy, pulled him aside, he said, hey, so-and-so, you know, I've got a sense of humor, I can take a joke, but you keep bringing this up over and over, and I really don't appreciate that. And in fact, I find that pretty uh, mean-spirited, and I'd like it to stop. And I, I thought I should come to you, you know, because I figure it's better talking to you about this, you know, man to man, rather than, you know, talking to HR or, you know, our boss. I'd rather just work this out with you. He said, you know, if I was a different religion, you would never say something like this. So I would just hope that you would show the same respect to me that I'm showing to you. Do not be weak. There's nothing spiritual about weakness, but be gentle. Deconstruct the narrative. Deconstruct the narrative. As I said, the, the argument is not even an argument when it comes to the narrative of Christianity in our culture. Instead, what we're seeing is a narrative about Christians. Why is it that every time you turn on the TV, when there's a Christian character, they're always hypocritical, stupid, ignorant, and so forth? Why is it that we don't have a... I can't think of a single character that's a Christian that people root for in the show or the movie. Maybe you can. Congratulations. Like, that's really good. I'm happy for you. I can't. But it's a narrative about Christians. It's, it's not reflective of Christians. The way we can do this is to what I call holding up the mirror. What this means is we're basically reflecting back what people are saying or doing. John 18, 22, one of the temple guards slapped Jesus across the face. Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I'm speaking the truth, why are you beating me? Holding up the mirror, it, you, just did, you just said this thing to me. Why are you doing that? You just did this thing to me. Why are you doing that? There was a young woman that I knew, short, petite, not especially courageous, I wouldn't say, but not shy either. She was working in a salon where she works, and this big guy, I mean, he was really old. He was like my age, you know, comes into the salon to get his hair cut, and, you know, at the time, they were supposed to wear masks, and he was cussing up a storm about that, and hated wearing masks, and real big, boisterous personality, and he sat down, and he's six foot two, and probably that much wide, you know, and he's sitting down in the chair. My friend was there cutting his hair, and all of a sudden, spiritual things came up, and she told him what church that she went to, and this guy said, well, I heard that's a hypocritical church. I heard it's a cult. I heard it's a mind-bending, brainwashed, gaslight, you know. He said this as loud as anything in front of all of her colleagues and her friends in the salon. So she turned to him and she said, do you really believe that I'm in a cult? He said, yeah, I believe that. She asked him, do you think it's a dangerous cult? Oh, yeah, it's dangerous, all right. Then she said, and you think that the best way to help me out of a dangerous, life-threatening cult is to shame me publicly at my place of work? <laughs> Scientists are still studying this, but in that moment, she grew three inches. <laughs> 
this big, rough and tumble guy shrunk. He said, I'm sorry. He said, I grew up in a fundamentalist home. I've never been to that church. I, I don't know anything about it. I just heard things about it. They ended up talking about Christ for the next 30 minutes. He left, gave her a big tip, and he said, you know, I just wish people would be able to talk like this more often. And she told me, she said, I wish I could agree. <laughs> I didn't, didn't feel that way. Holding up the mirror. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe? Do you realize the seriousness of what you're saying? Trust that people are smart enough to see the truth for themselves. People can see truth from a lie. And as our culture moves more and more into a post-Christian, post-truth culture, I still believe in the words of Jesus. I still believe that they will be able to know disciples of Christ by the way we love one another. They will be able to know that Jesus was sent into the world because of the unity given in the body of Christ. They will be able to know through our lives. I trust that. I believe that. I believe that more than I believe the hatred and the vitriol. I believe in the Word of God, that that is always going to be true, even to the end of the age. And finally, don't magnify people. Psalm 118, verse 6, the psalmist writes this, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can human beings do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in people. Do you have really big people in your life or do you have a really big God in your life? Picture that person that comes into your mind that's given you such offense for your dedication to Jesus Christ. Picture that person in your mind. You know who that person is? A very small person. And when you picture God, what's your picture? He's a very big God. God is with us. He said He'd be with us to the end of the age. He indwells us. He empowers us. We should not be afraid. Do not be afraid of people. If I could leave you with one thing, it'd be this. Do you think the dedication to Christ is going to make everyone like you? If you believe that, quit now. You know, we're talking about a real endeavor to go and reach people for Jesus Christ. And if you're stepping out there thinking that everyone is going to like you for that, that is absurd to someone trained in the teaching of Scripture. That is not true. That's not real. Have you made up your mind in advance to suffer for Jesus Christ and to suffer for His people? When Jesus confronted Saul, Paul, on the road to Damascus, He said, why are you persecuting me? To be identified with Jesus is to be identified with His church the universal church across the world. And yes, I do. I do identify with this church. I love this church. This church pulled me out of a gutter. This church, when I think of my marriage, when I think of my parenting, when I think of my friendships, thank you, God, for this church. And no, I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm not going to be cowardly about it. I love this church. I've given my adult life to serving here in this church. And I've made up my mind about that. I made that decision in April of 2005. I'm in this for the long haul. I don't care about the persecution. Whose approval am I living for anyways? I believe this is for everybody. But I just reached a point in my life where I realized I don't care what people think of me. Sorry. I really hate your Christian convictions. I really hate your dedication to Christ. I really hate that you... I don't care what people think. Who cares what they think? I care what Jesus Christ thinks. And I know that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I know that he says, come into the joy of your, your master. I know that he says, you're going to be with me forever. I, I'm preparing a place for you. I'm so proud of you. In Matthew 3, at Jesus' baptism, Jesus emerged from the water and the Holy Spirit descended and the Father said, this is my agapetas, my beloved one, in whom I am well pleased. 
Oh yeah, of course God the Father is well pleased with Jesus. Who wouldn't be, right? That's the kind of kid you'd want to have, right? But Ephesians 1, right around verse 7, says that we are now in the agapetas, in the beloved one. And so when we think about God and his view of us, when he looks at us, he says, I am very well pleased with you. I love that you trust me. I love that you follow me. I'm so happy with you. I can't wait to be with you. We're going to pray to him for years. We're going to read his word for years. But there's one day we're going to be with him face to face. And I can't wait for that moment.